Well, so, um, can you each talk a bit about your own identity and how it has affected um, your own approach to these issues? Cool. <laughs> um, so, I am a black queer male artist, right? Like, that's my identity. Not that. Those are my identities. And I think, and me and Jess's talk based, this is a bit about this kind of the catalyst of why we did uh, artists against police violence is that I didn't necessarily feel safe enough because of my identity to declare claims against Ferguson, about Ferguson. I'm not one of those people that can write something on their Facebook being like, oh, how messed up this is, blah, blah, blah. I just don't feel very safe to do that, right? And it was so funny, like my mother, when I was telling my mom, I was like, oh, I'm going to recently speak about this. She was like, be careful what you say. Because like, people are crazy. And like, that type of like, fear, right? Like, 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 being afraid to speak is kind of like my personal struggle with my identity. So I'm an artist. So I put, I figure out my like, voice to my visual vocabulary. And like, that's how I express and like, kind of tackle these issues, right? Like, I'm trying to make work about it. And that's what Arts Against Police Violence is about. It's like, if you don't necessarily feel safe enough to speak your words, draw your words, make poetry, you know, like, shoot photography about it. And I think, like, that's just my specific kind of, like, I was born in Boston. My, my parents are from the Cape Verde Islands, a former Portuguese colony off the west coast of Africa. And they felt, coming to this country, that they were something other than Negro, colored, black, whatever you want to call them, whatever era it was. And they felt that, you know, we were different or separate from, you know, that experience. Uh, and we didn't need to get involved. In, well, they didn't need to get involved in civil rights back in the 50s or whatever. I, of course, was growing up in that era. Uh, and, you know, so it was really confusing, you know, growing up uh, in terms of identity. Grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood in Boston, the South End, and had friends, but it, we were okay. But with the way my parents would talk about others, it was almost like they were a different group of people all together. But yet we were the color that we are. And then I got older and went to high school and college, and I could see that it really didn't matter if you were Cape Verdean or Dominican or Puerto Rican, you were black, period. And, and, and that white folks, they don't have time to, to figure out, are you Cape Verdean, are you from Alabama? They said, no, you just got us, you black. And that's really what it is. So a lot of people of color struggle with their identity in terms of not trying to be black or trying to be something <laughs> other or whatever, not realizing that in America, if you're not white, you are non-white. You are the other. So you might as well just understand and realize that. And that's how you're going to be dealt with and certainly when I told my parents that I was going through this struggle and that struggle, even in college, they would always blame it on me not working hard enough. You know, not, not working hard enough. And, and, and I could see when I got my first job in Boston at City Hall, people that, you know, had this, you know, certain degrees and they were moving up, becoming directors, and, and, and they were saying, Jim, you're, you're going to get your opportunity. I mean, you know, you're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not a dumb guy. You know, you went to Dartmouth College for undergrad and University of Pennsylvania for grad school, so you're not that dumb. You're going to get your opportunity. And I'm like, huh? You know, uh, something's wrong with this picture. I'm not getting equal opportunity here. So I wonder what this could be from. And, you know, I told my parents, I said, you know, I think it's because of the color of my skin. And I can't justify it any other way. Here's a person who doesn't have half the experience. And yet he's began, he's, he's a director here. This other person has a third of the experience. He's a director there. They don't look like me. They don't look like the friends. <laughs> but yet they're moving quickly uh, through the system. And, and, and there's no fairness in that. You know, and you keep on blaming the fact that I'm not working hard enough. No, I'm working hard enough. There's something else happening. It's called institutional racism. And, uh, and that's what I, I realized that I had to go for a person that came from a foreign country, even though I was born here have a birth certificate that says white because of what my parents were allowed to put on. And here, and here, I, here I am coming from that kind of a beginning to being the president of the NAACP. So look at that. Uh, you know, that's an awareness that seldom happens with a lot of people that are in my situation. But glad, I hope, I'm so happy that I came to an awareness early that, that there were problems that were beyond me not just working hard enough. Actually, my experience is kind of similar to your own. Uh, my parents are Haitian, and they, came, they come from that in Haiti, which um, was originally like a slave colony until we took our independence back. Um, and so when I came over here, my 
I was placed I was placed in schools that were diverse, but my classrooms were not diverse because I was placed in upper level um, classes, so it was predominantly white. And I remember my tell my parents telling me when I go to school that like you have to look nice, you have to look nicer, you have to be better, you have to be smarter. Not because you have to, but because of the color of your skin, people will perceive you. And so as I continued going through these classes, I constantly felt the pressure to have to work harder, I have to work harder. And um, coming to spaces like Grizzly as an artist of color, I like, became more aware of my identity here and similar to your experience with um, uh, different members of the African diaspora where like, people were saying like, oh no, I'm not African American, I'm this, oh no, I'm not, I'm this. I'm like, you know, the KKK came up in here and they wanted to kill people. They're not going to divide you guys up and be like, you're actually this and you're this and you're this kind of black. It's like, you're all black. And so I had that kind of experience and that's what um, kind of awakened me and like my identity. And um, I put it in my work and I, I, I feel like we identify, some of us identify as visual activists and I use that as an opportunity to talk about race in my work and my identity. But I find it difficult when people don't understand your experience and they look at your work as if it's other and you're put in this box as like a black artist and you're constantly like, okay, well, why can't I just be an artist? Just because my art is about race does not add automatically mean I'm a black artist. And so you feel like, will I get a job with this type of art? Will I have opportunities because I make this type of art? And it's just a constant struggle in that one. I remember when I was applying a job to something like, like two years ago. Uh, to your point of like being a black artist and making black work. And I went to like this famous book designer and he looked at my work and he was like, this is nice, but like can you do any other work besides work that deals with race? Like are you capable? Like can you only articulate that? And I was like, are you, are you kidding me? I was like, that, no, of course I can make work about anything. I was like, this is a bore. This is not the only thing I can talk about. So I had a very like super similar experience to you like that. Thank you for sharing that. I think I think that it speaks to um, our society as we as we move forward with uh, race and racial politics. There's kind of this pocket within white supremacy of acceptable blackness where you can be black but not too black to, point to the point where it scares people because now like power and systems of oppression are becoming more invisible and now it's, you can't, you can't explicitly say, oh, uh, you know, he's a nigger, he's just not a third, you, but if you say, oh, he, he was a thug, he wore a hoodie, we know what you're implying, but you're not actually explicitly saying that and it makes it harder for um, for people of color, more specifically black folks, to uh, detect that. Um, yeah. we, we detect it. We, we know. But I think that a lot of a lot of white white folks um, when they say stuff like Oh, you don't act black, you know. You're, you're like, or I've I've had you know some white friends go, you know, I'm black and me, what do you like? And I think that that's that kind of speaks to what I what I want to say. You understand? Yeah. Like microaggressions, coded language. Yeah, exactly. I guess I'd, I'd like to just add to that point that you know I think I've tried to develop an appreciation of the differences. I grew up in the city of Central Falls. If anybody is familiar with the city of Central Falls, it's an economically depressed area, probably the worst in the state of Rhode Island, and maybe close to one of the worst in the, in the region. But what was great about the city it was the diversity and culture in the city. And even back, you know, when I was a kid, it was extremely uh, diverse. And I had a lot of friends that were just multicultural, and you got to appreciate the differences. And I think that's, that's what's helped me understand that the differences that will make us a better society. I think that's, so bringing back my childhood to try to appreciate the differences among even us and the panels here, it, it just helps me understand that and appreciate that more because of the background of living in a challenging city. Um, so, uh, I find this American and um, I'm a first generation Chinese American, so my parents like, in the middle grade here when they were like in the 
in their 30s and stuff, and I like, kind of was the first generation to be born here, and um, kind of like, kind of like for both of my parents, like English was their second language, and I feel like, um, kind of ever since I started like making work about like my, about like my journey and about oppression, I felt like, I also felt like a deep responsibility to like make it because I knew that like my parents like and all my ancestors like never would. And because and and um and I think also like um like I think also like um part of the finding of like parties against police violence, like like I felt like um I felt like when a lot of the protests happened, like like I didn't feel, I, I felt extremely like immobilized, and I didn't kind of felt like as a non-black person of color, like um, like it wasn't exactly like my, um, like my space to like repeat um, a lot of the things that I felt like um, a lot of like a lot of like the black um, activists around me were like already saying like so well, so like like I was thinking of. I was, thinking, I was thinking about how to like properly like respond to it, and I felt like, um, I felt like the best thing for me to do, um, um, because I felt like I couldn't write the poem, um, was to just like create a platform for, um, for other people to like find their voice. How um, through that process, like I feel like I've been able to find mine. I think that speaks to um, <coughs> marginalized groups having allies outside that group that are able to articulate uh, what, what the marginalized group is saying without trying to co-opt or direct the message. And I think that, that some of that happen, needs to happen within the black community, more specifically um, along gender lines, because uh, black men are tend to be very patriarchal, very masculine, um, and we tend to push our female voices to the side because you know a lot of the Black history leaders you learn about are men. You know Martin Luther King, uh, Malcolm X. Uh, you know when you learn about Rosa Parks, there's always there's there's always this kind of secondary role she plays, like. She she got the ball rolling, but Martin and Malcolm, you know, handled everything. And I think that when I when my my black feminist, feminist female friends articulate, you know, problems that black women have to me, uh, I do have a an obligation to allow them to voice those concerns, um, to offer any critiques or any questions that I have, so that. I can clarify what they're saying, and then it's my job to uh, take what they're saying and share those with with other men without uh, kind of nitpicking at them or trying to direct where their their uh, ideas or thoughts go. And that before we can we can do that, you know, on a more national level. Uh, on a more racial level between black and white, there also needs to be some of that within our own communities. I guess the frustration that I have is that, you know, and I know this can be frustrating to, to, to some of you, is that, you know, on so many levels, things aren't better than they were 50 years ago. Uh, tomorrow morning at uh, 9 a.m., the NAACP and the Coalition of 100 Black Women are going to have a prize showing of the movie Selma at the Promise Place Mall. So, if you can get up at 9 o'clock in the morning, we'll, we'll welcome all, each and every one of you. But, you know, on so many levels, things are better. I mean, you know, now I can sit at a lunch counter. I don't have to drink in the colored only water fountain. I can, you know, uh, not ride in the back of a bus. Uh, now we have Oprah. We have uh, a president, Barack Obama, even the governors, senators. You know, uh, we have Will Smith. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, you have all of this, and you didn't have that 50 years ago, isn't things great? Yeah, things are great. But when you think about the fact that unemployment in 1965 
for blacks was double that for whites, and it still is to this day. It might even be higher versus whites today than it was even 50 years ago. And when you think of the fact that wealth, which drives this country, I think the median household wealth uh, income, the uh, median household wealth for whites is about $110,000 per household in this country. What do you think it is for black households? It's $5,000, 21 times less than for whites. And that's today, in 2015. And that's because of the decades of institutional racism in terms of the housing market, where you couldn't live wherever you could. You had deed restrictions, you had restrictive covenants, you had uh, federal government that would not guarantee loans for blacks even in the 60s. So wealth could not be transferred because you could not accumulate wealth, even in my memory. So, you know, it's okay that we have a president in the White House, but what about the other 40 million black people? What about the rest of us? You know, with all these uh, mass incarceration statistics staring us in the face. About half the people in jail are black, but they are 13% of the population. How can that be? She mentions arrest rates, yes. Even in Rhode Island, three times more blacks arrested for marijuana, even though the usage is the same. That's today. That's been proven <coughs> twice by the ACLU. So things are better in some ways, and they're great in other ways. And I think that from the majority community, that's what they see. But they seldom hear or see the reality that in some key ways, things are a lot worse than they were in 1965. Today, a lot worse economically in terms of jobs, all the manufacturing jobs are gone. The education system has not pivoted, at least in our communities. You know, we have the same poor schools that we had then, but it's even more important because then you didn't have to have a college degree where now you do. And then when I was going to school, my freshman year, I think uh, tuition for the board was $5,000 for the whole year. Same school now is 62000 for the whole year. So it's different. So what, so what, what is one to do? So I'm looking at the masses, not just from Oprah and Denzel Washington. That's good for them. But how about the other 40 million people where things are not even as good today as it was for their grandparents 50 years ago? What about that situation? And people that are good and smart, they seem oblivious to what I'm talking about. It's, it's like, wow, is this the first time I'm ever hearing about this? I'm saying, you have a PhD, you're just learning about this now? That's, <coughs> I, I guess that's part of my privilege, you're not having to think about that. But it's just part of the problem. We have to start just understanding that there's a reality here and it ain't all pretty.